I got something in the mail a few months ago calling itself a brochure of COVID-19 facts. I read through it dumbfounded by the blatant untruths. Do misinformation campaigns ever have an innocent side? Is there a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation at the heart of it? How do we see through the fog of data around us? We're going to talk about vaccinating against misinformation tonight, and we have excellent resources for further reading and viewing from the Wichita Public Library. Check out the link for that and send your questions or comments and we'll get to as many as we can. To begin this evening, we'll talk with Wichita native Susan Page, the Washington Bureau Chief for USA Today and author. Her new book, Madam Speaker, Nancy Pelosi and the Lessons of Power is now available for pre-order. Later in the hour, we'll add a few more voices to the, the discussion. Put your questions in the comments below or email us at info at kmuw.org. Susan, thank you so much for being here tonight. Oh, it's so great to be back in Wichita, even if it's only virtually. <laughs> so fake news is a term used as an insult sometimes and as a warning other times. How do you define it? And what is the difference between misinformation and disinformation? Well, misinformation can be accidental. Um, it can be not nefarious. Um, it can be the result of a misunderstanding. but. What I would call fake news, it's not a, a term I love, but what I would call disinformation is something that, that is nefarious. It's designed to misinform people, to put, put a wedge uh, between people, to uh, spread lies. Uh, and you know, this is not something I was aware of until four years ago. And in the 2016 campaign, uh, which I was covering for USA Today, um, I found something I'd not seen before in the previous campaigns I'd covered, and that would be, I'd go to a Trump rally and I would say to voters, why are you for, for Donald Trump? And I had a voter say to me, I'm for Donald Trump because the Pope endorsed him. And I said, I'm pretty sure the Pope did not endorse Donald Trump. And he insisted he had seen it on his Facebook feed uh, and that it was true. And then repeatedly, multiple people at rallies would say, uh, I'm not for Hillary Clinton because the Clintons, because the US government, they made the US government, the Clintons did pay for Chelsea's wedding. And I would say, you know, uh, I've covered, you know, I was I've covered the Clinton White House. That that isn't true. The government did not pay for Chelsea's wedding, but they insisted it was true. And it was only after the election was over when some of the extreme measures taken by foreign actors, foreign governments, uh, uh, groups inside the United States to spread things that they knew were lies, that was, it was only then that I was aware about how widespread this was and how effective it could be. Uh, and so for the last four years, I think we've all tried to pay more attention to this phenomenon and to be better prepared to respond to it than we were in 2016. So this is really, this is really something new. Um, just blatant lies. This is this is a new phenomenon. It sounds like it's really. I mean, it, it kind of it seems like the sort of thing that we would be, you know, making a fuss over now. But oh, it's happened all along. But it, this is really something different than what you've seen with other presidential campaigns. You know, I think that the efforts to spread lies are are go way back in our history. I, I don't I don't think that's new. It's the ability of social media to spread them that makes it a different kind of factor than it was before. And I think also the efforts by foreign governments and foreign actors to try to affect our elections by manipulating social media, uh, by using disinformation, that's what I think is new. I think you could probably go back to the election of Thomas Jefferson and find examples of his opponents spreading lies but it didn't have the same force that we see today when you can put something on Twitter and on Facebook um, and it can just take off and make people either believe it or else not believe anything. You know, I think some people are so concerned about the spread of disinformation that they don't know who to believe, so they don't believe anybody. There's so much that you can tell us about what you've witnessed uh, covering the White House and so much media evolution. Um, how has this information war progressed over the past 10 to 20 years? Or has it really all just been like the last five years that so much has changed? 
You know, it's uh, this is uh, this election, uh, the 2020 election is the, actually the 11th presidential campaign I've covered. I've covered every one of them since 1980. And the change in the way the news media is has just been, it's just been transformed, um, you know, and in some ways more than once uh, from newspapers to the, the explosion of cable TV as a factor to now social media being the way a lot of people get most of their news. It's just different. And the, the challenges are different. And the way people get their information is different. I think a lot of people now feel bombarded by information. I mean, in, in, so, in some ways, this is a good thing. There are lots of sources of information. Uh, the internet gives you the ability to find out information in a million different ways. Uh, but it also gives you a way to find out information in a million different ways. So how do you figure out what information you can trust, what information you, you need to know, and how to make sense of it? Because making sense of all this information we get, I think sometimes that may be the hardest thing of all. Yeah. Social media, um, you know, has, with it kind of speeding up the dissemination of information, um, has also sort of forced media organizations to be 24 seven organizations and rush to be the first to get, you know, something out. And that's, and led, you know, that has led to errors as well. Um, do you think that speed is a factor in eroding people's faith in journalism? You know, it, it can be. Uh, the rush to be first um, can make news organizations make errors. Uh, you know, you, you want to be first, but you want to be first to be right. Um, that can er erode trust. I think also the, the thing that, that I worry more about is the rush to, to the bright, shiny object that is right in front of you, um, which leaves you sometimes just chasing your tail as opposed to doing uh, journalism that is um, maybe gets fewer clicks but has more meaning. And that's been a challenge in covering uh, President Trump because he's very pr provocative. That's something his supporters like about him. He is he 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 uses Twitter in a way we've never seen a public official use Twitter before. And when this first happened, many organizations. We found ourselves chasing every tweet, every provocative tweet that we, we now make, I think, a more concerted effort to both cover what he's saying on Twitter, because you cannot ignore when a president is saying very provocative things on Twitter, but also to make sure we're doing other things as well uh, that we think are important, like fact, we do more fact checking now than we used to. We do more stories that are like, like we posted a story um, at 12, about 12 hours ago about here are the things we don't know about President Trump's executive orders. Uh, because the president over the weekend, uh, as you know, signed four uh, executive notes or orders and portrayed them one way. We're trying to go back and look at what they actually say when you look at the language. That's the kind of journalism that we want to do enough of because that, that, that's something people can look at, can trust, and can have bring, um, bring some uh, have some effect on their own lives. If you want to look and see what did the president do when it came to preventing people from getting evicted uh, from rental homes and apartments, what what did, it, did the president do about enhanced federal unemployment benefits? Um, these are things I think are important for people to understand. And that's one of the things that we try to do, as well as covering the most provocative statements the president can make. Do you think that's a trend in, in media organizations or are you guys sort of leading the charge in this sort of shift in how you cover things like social media from politicians? Oh, I think we've all, I think when you think about the mainstream media, I think all of us have been trying to do this. It's been, you know, you at, at the end of every uh, presidential election, I, I always feel like um, I got that. Why didn't I understand that faster? Why didn't I why didn't I understand this thing that we now recognize when we see the vote totals? Why didn't I recognize that in September? Why did I have to wait to November to understand that? And I think all of us feel that way after covering elections. And what did we do wrong that we can do better next time? And 2016 was an election where I think we did a number of things wrong. I think we weren't listening hard enough to voters. And I think we were too quick to assume that Hillary Clinton was going to win. And I think we were too distracted by provocative things, sometimes at the expense of stories that would have had more meaning. So those are all lessons that I think um, lots of news organizations 
try to take to heart to do better the next time around. Hmm. So I want to talk about how interpretations and bias can affect the messages that people receive. Um, we're somewhat accustomed to this coming from politicians, and less so from health professionals maybe, um, but increasingly from members of the media. And do you think that something has changed? Are journalists more biased or showing their bias more? Or does the public perceive that coverage differently? What is shifting there? So, you know, this is uh, something that I think um, uh, is important for mainstream reporters like myself to pay attention to because I try very hard not to be biased. Um, I don't think anyone cares about my political point of view. I think they care about what I see and can describe and the context in which I can place it so they can make their own decisions about what to make of it. And I want my readers to think that's what I'm doing. Uh, but you know, there are all kinds of journalists and there are, you can, we talk about the news media. The news media is a million different things. And some aspects of the news media do not have that as their goal. They're trying to advocate a point of view. Um, that's perfectly legitimate, but it's different from what I'm doing. And I think what happens sometimes is that readers and viewers don't distinguish between different kinds of journalists who are trying to do different kinds of things. You know, we because there's so many ways to get information, there's a bigger burden on readers and viewers to figure out who they're gonna to listen to or what they're gonna read. Um, and one of the things I think is important is for Americans to figure out who they trust and then to, 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 and to, to some degree to rely on that, those outlets that they trust when they try to figure out what's true and what's not. For instance, I trust NPR. So if I hear a news story on NPR, I'm assuming that it is fairly done and doesn't come with a lot of spin. I trust PBS uh, as well. I trust USA Today. Um, and somebody else's list of the news organizations they trust will be different, but I think it's important to have some that you're gonna pay attention to so that you are not only listening to your Facebook feed. Hmm. Do you think that there are also value differences uh, from different organizations that drive this kind of divergence in how something is covered or what actually ends up getting covered? And that's just one more thing for people mm -hmm. to kind of ferret that out and then decide where they, you know, whether or not they align. Yeah. So when you think, when you think about values, what are you thinking about as particularly? Well, I mean, uh, one thing that you hear a lot about is the value of free speech, but it can sometimes seem like this value of free speech makes just makes way for falsehoods to exist and for us to not, um, I don't know, for us to not uh, eliminate those out of you know, whatever the, the resource is, because it's free speech, so you can say mm -hmm. anything. I mean, you know, it, it, I, I don't know exactly. I think there are, are there are different um, distinctions on what people should know about that, that kind of drive back to values that maybe you could align to a different political party. Does that make you sense? Know, um, there, the values, are, of course, values are an important part of what everybody does, uh, whether they recognize it or not. So if you're thinking about what are, what are my values, my values would be transparency, um, the disinfecting effect of sunlight, um, accountability uh, by people with power, um, a need to look out for people who don't have power. Those are the values that I would bring to what I do. Other journalists would have other values. They might have uh, liberty, you know, you might, be interested in liberty. You might feel like you're a libertarian and you want to listen to news sources that reflect that point of view or a Republican point of view or a liberal point of view or a Democratic point of view. Um, but the thing that, i tell you, the thing that concerns me when we think about the changes since I started covering politics to now, one of the big things that, that's changed is that the erosion of the idea that there's a set of facts we can all agree on and then perspectives about what to do with them that we can disagree on. And increasingly, there is not much common ground between um, people who are pretty conservative and people who are pretty liberal on what we even think is happening in the country. 
you know, the, the coronavirus has been an example of that. There are big partisan differences on how serious it is and what ought to be done about it. And I think that there was, I think in 1980, when I started in this, if there was a, a pandemic, that wouldn't have been an issue of partisan disagreement. I think that reflects something about what's happened to our kind of national conversation that that concerns me. I want us to be able to have sources of information that we think this, they're telling me what they saw, um, they're putting it in a fair historic context, and then I'm free to disagree with my neighbor about whether that means we should do this or we should do that. So um, how does losing trust in an objective media ultimately affect democracy? What's that you know, domino effect? How can journalism be a watchdog to the government if no one listens when it barks? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great question because it's very corrosive. We know that the founders had a free press as part of the construct to making the American democracy work. So if we don't have a free press that people, that most people have trust in, it is hard to make democracy work. Uh, and you just look at that, at, look, we're just, uh, we're just two and a half months out from election day. What happens on election day if a lot of Americans don't think the election was fairly counted, if ballots weren't cast in a fair way, um, uh, ballots weren't counted in a fair way, a fair and accurate way. What, where do we go from there uh, if that's what happens? And think about the, this is not a concern we had even in 2000, you know, the 2000 election, historic election because it was kind of a tie. You know, Al Gore won the popular vote very narrowly, big dispute about the count uh, in the Electoral College, a Supreme a divided Supreme Court awarded Florida to George W. Bush, and that was the election. And Americans, by and large, accepted that result. Uh, there were not riots in the street by Democrats who thought that the Supreme Court had stolen the election from Al Gore, although there were some Democrats who, who you know, thought maybe that had happened. But if that result happened again this November, I think there would be, we would have many more problems with getting Americans to accept the result of the election than we did in 2000, and that, and that concerns me. I want to get to a few um, listener or email questions here. This is an email from John. Um, what are your thoughts on how Twitter and Facebook have handled misinformation <laughs> differently? Yeah, so big struggle for the big tech companies and social media companies on how to handle it. I think there is an agreement that they both need to be more aggressive in handling disinformation. One thing that Facebook has just announced is that it's cracking down on partisan organizations that create things that sound like newspapers and get on their Facebook news feed because they sound like a newspaper when in fact they are a political outlet. That's absolutely something they should do. Things that are clearly inaccurate. Um, you know, inaccurate accounts of vaccinations and what they do, inaccurate accounts of what are effective medications to tr consider with, with uh, COVID-19. These are things I think with the power that these platforms have, they have an obligation to try to police their platform. They are not some neutral playground where anybody with a ticket can get in. They have a bigger responsibility than that. That is a, and that is a change in kind of the concept, I think, of the role that these companies have. But given where we see the spread of disinformation on their platforms, I think there is a uh, growing agreement that that's what they need to do. What, what do you, what do you, so let me ask you a question. So how do you deal with this information yourself? Like, how do you see it and what do you do about it? Well, actually, I was just going to mention today, I, I got onto Facebook and saw for the first time, don't get on Facebook very often. I saw, so I don't know if this is new or, or how new it is, but I saw a fact check over a, a friend's post and it showed, um, you know, I could kind of read what was under it. And then I, I went and read the fact check and it gave like the logic for why this was a flawed, <laughs> uh, a flawed piece. And I, I appreciated that. Um, and I don't know, I mean, personally, I don't know how much even the fact checks from Facebook and Twitter will affect people's opinions of whatever it is. It almost seems like, um, when someone has decided to 
believe a thing or trust a source, whatever it is that uh, aligns with their own personal, either their suspicion of how the world is or what they already think, they just kind of want the echo chamber. I don't really, I mean, I don't know. It just, it seems like I would be a little doubtful that people will, will even, or at least that all people will accept it. Maybe it will make a little bit of a difference. Um, but so I think that's so great because you could still read the post, but you also saw that there was a fact check on it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, Americans are pretty, Americans are both pretty smart and very concerned, right? <laughs> I, we know this, we do all these, the USA Today does all these polling uh, polls, and often I'll spend time calling back people who were polled to get to talk to them about the results of the poll to get some quotes to put in my story. And I'm struck by how Americans of all stripes really care about the country, um, even though they come at it from a million, from very different, from very different sides. And there, there can't, there cannot possibly be a downside to flagging something that is demonstrably untrue and having a fact check. So you have to see that at least there's another, at least there's another point of view. I think that is entirely appropriate and important to do. But let me ask you, what did your friend think about having it posted with a fact check? I couldn't tell. I don't. She didn't comment on it, and I didn't ask her. But um, yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, mm -hmm. I, I would like to know what she thought about it. Yeah. Maybe I'll go catch up with her. But I think if it had happened to something that I forwarded, I would just be shocked because I, I wouldn't forward something knowing that it was untrue. And if I did, and then it or share something, not a Facebook person. Uh, if I shared a thing and it got that slapped on it, I would be probably just a little embarrassed <laughs> because but you know, I would have thought it was true. That's why I shared it, you know? But see, what might have happened, say that happened, then you might think, oh, I didn't know that wasn't true. I thought that was true. I thought the Pope did endorse Donald Trump. Right. And then you might say, hey, friends, by the way, the Pope did not endorse Donald Trump. My bad. I'm sorry I posted this. I mean, that is, that is, uh, that would be great, right? That would be um, sort of all of us trying to figure out together uh, what's right and what's not. And that is something very new that, that Facebook is doing. Um, and only under, you know, considerable public pressure because we've seen, we saw the consequences of, we've seen the consequences of disinformation. I uh, know some of the ways in which we're being manipulated. We really need to get a better as the kind of, uh, you know, um, rich democracy that we've had for hundreds of years. Yeah. I have a couple more uh, audience questions that I'd like to get in here before we leave, lose you <laughs> to the news cycle today. Um, during the presidential debates, how should one candidate handle clear misinformation being stated by an opponent? That's an interesting question. So it's such a dilemma for candidates uh, because you only get 90 seconds, right? You're going to use some of your 90 seconds arguing about what the other guy said, or you're going to try to put forward whatever it is that you want to say. Uh, that is one role of the journalist, uh, the moderator. Um, and we, you know, we saw this very, I did, if you watch Fox News Sunday, you saw Chris Wallace do an interview with President Trump two weeks ago in which he pretty much did fact checking on the fly. Um, you know, challenge things that were, uh, that the president said that weren't true. Um, and not in a partisan way, because we know that, uh, um, uh, we know that, uh, you know, Fox News is thought of as a um, organization that a lot of conservatives watch and trust, uh, but in a, in a journalistic way. And that is the kind of role I think the moderators need to play more than the other candidate. It's just, you know, these, these debates are so, um, uh, prop, you know, it's just they're so difficult for the candidates, uh, and they have to calculate whether they want to spend their time correcting the other guy. Yeah. Um, one more uh, email question here. This one from Kathy. Uh, are there any media outlets that span the gap that are respected by both sides of the aisle? Yes. Yeah, I think there are. Um, so, radio, NPR, television. Uh, PBS. I also, um, I think CBS um, uh, is uh, a network I trust. <clears throat> and I think NBC correspondents are, are really strong as well. You think about 
uh, newspapers, I, of course, trust USA Today. And I think that USA Today has a level of trust because we circulate all across the country, we circulate in Wichita, Kansas, and in New York City. And that gives it as a, a kind of discipline about being fair and balanced that not organi that news newspapers that are grounded in one place maybe don't have. Um, you know, I, I think the New York Times is a great newspaper. Not everybody would agree with me, but it's a newspaper that I respect a lot. Also respect the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and there are people who might respect the Wall Street Journal who wouldn't be so enamored of, of the New York Times. So yes, I think there are some organizations that are trusted on both sides, but I think fewer than there used to be. Uh, and and that's, that's a dilemma. I, another dilemma is just the um, reduction in the number of news outlets that cover local and state affairs. So even though we have a million bloggers talking about Kamala Harris and what it means that she's been chosen for to be Biden's uh, running mate, we have fewer and fewer people covering the Kansas state legislature. Um, and that, that I, you know, if you talk, if you want to list the things I worry about in my industry, that would be high on the list too. Hmm. I want to ask you one more question before uh, we let you go here. Um, as a Wichita native, yes. what do you think of our media situation? This is a good segue, actually. <laughs> How do we prevent becoming a news desert? Uh, yes, well, I think that's important. So just to be clear on my credentials, I was born at Wesley Hospital. I went to Cost Harris Elementary School. I went to Robinson when it was a junior high, not a middle school. I went to Southeast, not in the fancy new building, but in the old building. Um, <laughs> And so I have I have deep uh, Wichita roots. Not only that, my first paying job in journalism was at the Wichita Eagle as a summer intern, uh, where I was paid $100 a week, and I thought it was a fortune. So I I you know I at the time I was there, Wichita had two newspapers that a morning newspaper and an afternoon paper that competed against one another, um, and active TV stations. I don't know exactly what the situation is there now, but a city the size of Wichita should be able to support local journalism to take a look at, at what's happening. I'll tell you what was at the, 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 the uh, my, that summer internship, which was my first paying job in journalism. At that time, the publisher of the Wichita Eagle was being prosecuted in federal court for tax evasion. And every day, the Wichita Eagle reporter would go, the courthouse reporter would go there, cover the trial, write about it, and the Wichita Eagle would run a story about it in the paper. Not always a very long story, but they ran a story about it every day. That's what that's what we that's why we need journalism um, in cities uh, the size of Wichita as well as in cities the size of New York. Hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It has been such a pleasure talking with you. I really appreciate your time. Hey, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Well, this is Digital Democracy on Tap. I'm Sarah Jane Crespo, and we're talking about misinformation and how to inoculate against it. We've been with Susan Page of USA Today. Thank you so much again, Susan. Now we're going to go to Amy DeVault, Project Manager for the Wichita Journalism Collaborative and Journalism Instructor at Wichita State. Angela Smith, Digital Content Manager at KWCH and former KMUW News Lab intern, Larissa Lowry, who is now a fake news researcher and a journalism PhD student at the University of Missouri. We want you to join the conversation too. We'll try to get to all of your questions. So ladies, welcome to the panel. Um, we talked a bit about social media with Susan Page, but Larissa, can you uh, tell us a little bit about, um, a little more about the Twitter and Facebook fact checks on politicians and others? How do those work? We didn't really talk much about Twitter earlier. Right. And so um, with Facebook and Twitter, they are using hand fact checkers, um, and then they are also using AI and other um, computer generated fact checking resources. And so, um, a lot of times on Facebook, for example, if you see a post that you don't think is true, you can actually go in and tag the Facebook post as something you don't believe is true and as fake news, and then that will get flagged to Facebook. Um, and the last time I checked, after a certain number of flags, um, it'll be manually, manually reviewed by someone at Facebook, and then they will decide whether to put a fact check above it or not. So the um, post that you saw that had a fact check from your friend, someone else um, in your friend's feed has reported that as 
fake news. So it's oh. really um, part of community policing. Wow, I had no idea it worked that way. Yeah, so, the, yeah. The next time you're on Facebook, see, um, and you see something that's not true, see if you can report it. <laughs> I'll go hunting. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, well, ladies, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a new Gallup night study uh, that explored why Americans are losing faith in an objective media. Um, and it cited that Americans see bias increasing. But eight out of 10 Americans think inaccuracies in reporting are intentional. And a lot of that distrust cuts along partisan lines, with 71% of Republicans having an unfavorable opinion of the media compared to 22% of Democrats. What do you all think is the cure? We're kind of going to back it up here. What can we do about this? Angela, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I think the biggest thing is really to inform the public, uh, especially on our side, um, on the broadcast side, that we are delving deep into those issues and that we are um, vetting the information before we put it out there. I think that's one of the big things. We'll get uh, numerous emails from people saying, hey, we saw this article, you need to do something on it. And we know at that time, okay, we need to get that information and figure out where it's coming from and let them know that this is either a solid source who's reporting that, um, or maybe this is something that you may have seen in your Facebook feed and it indeed is not true. And so we um, at KWCH, of course, we have our Fact Finder 12 investigative team who has delved deep into this, um, the primary election. You know, we have tons of ads that we get on that side on the local level. And there are a lot of claims, especially uh, lately, that have come out. And so we go through each of those claims, find out where they come from, where they're been sourced from, and then lay out that information so that the public knows here's what's true and here's maybe what's put a spin on. Amy? Yeah. So it looks like you wanted to say something. Um, if, if a news organization doesn't have the trust of its public, doesn't, is not seen as a credible source, then I guess, you know, I think what is the purpose? And I have, I've taken journalism classes in two colleges and I teach at one now. And, and you know, I know this might sound start snarky, but I guess I miss the days when they taught us to lie and manipulate information. You know, that's just not what <laughs> journalists are taught to do. We're, we're taught to seek and report the truth, right? So um, I think whatever journalists can do to help educate the general public about how we do our jobs, how we go about finding information, how we go about fact checking, um, sort of give them that look behind the scenes. I think we need to do more of that right now because that trust is low. Let them see what that process looks like. Let more people um, talk directly to the journalists who are doing that work. Some of those things could help. Yeah. That's a great idea. Hopefully we can get into more um, really actionable ideas uh, this evening. Um, but in that same study, I want to go back to that one more time. It, it also shows that a majority of Americans think the media is under political attack, um, and yet they blame the media for political divisions. So is there sort of a chicken and egg situation here? Um, and how do we end that cycle? Maybe it's a, a, a further step into what you're talking about, Amy. Um, but what do you think, you guys? So one of the important things to understand about fake news is that the, there are two primary factors in the distribution of fake news. There is money and political ideology and power. So um, there uh, was one public pu publisher who, uh, during the 20 2016 election, he made $10,000 to $30,000 a month off of fake news. And so when there is real world advertising dollars behind you clicking on a piece of like propaganda or fake news, um, so there is an incentive, a financial one, to shock the public into clicking on an article. Additionally, there is a ideological power grab that's happening politically. And so um, it is a little bit of a chicken and an egg, but like most things, we can do our part by not helping create revenue through advertising dollars by participating in fake news outlets. Hmm. I feel like, 
you know, there's, so we want to just not click on the sensational things, I guess is what you're saying. But I mean, is there not, uh, you know, a deeper responsibility from the organizations that the platforms that are, I mean, I guess this is p partly what Facebook is starting to work out here. What do you think is uh, um, and the next step of that solution? So the biggest things are to not just read a headline and share it. So if you are deeply interested in this, um, you need to first confront your own biases. Um, one thing that I tell people that ask me about fake news is if you see an article headline that you deeply want to be true, like in your heart of hearts, you're like, oh, I hope this is true. Um, it's most likely not true. And before you share it to other people, you should do your due diligence. So yes, if that's clicking on the article, um, then that's something that you have to do. But don't share it to other people because it's one person's advertising revenue versus thousands of people's advertising revenue. Additionally, um, particularly on Twitter and Facebook, it's important to be aware of bots. Um, so in 2017, um, some data scientists that I follow estimated that there are 23 million bots on Twitter and 140 million bots on Facebook. So before you start engaging in discourse and like conversations online, it's important to first re like understand if the person that you're talking to or retweeting or commenting on their status is a real person or if it's just a fake account. So that's okay. another way to be uh, aware of what's going on. For anyone who isn't completely confident in what a bot is, can you just explain it real quickly and, and how, how might you not know that you're talking to a, a robot, a bot. Uh, so uh, <laughs> sometimes you'll see a friend who is not very political or doesn't really tweet a whole bunch. Suddenly their account is becoming like a pro Trump account or a pro Biden account. It's important to reach out to them and say, Hey, is this actually you tweeting? So that's step one. Um, because a bot is a computer generated account that is programmed to interact with politically charged um, or viral posts. So a lot of times if you Google a story and there are hundreds of thousands of tweets that, there are, that are the exact same, and they're trying to promote the story so it'll go viral so the person will garner attention around that topic or financial um, sort of seem like another person or do they also in some cases take over you know aunt tilly's twitter account both um ah. in 2016 a lot of dead people were tweeting about their favorite political candidate mm -hmm. um so there was a lot of backlash against twitter and facebook for that uh so the biggest thing is sometimes we get very angry about things that we see on social media and someone could have programmed that to be there so that you would get angry and respond to it and contribute to the story's viralness. Hmm. Wow. It kind of puts a little of the, the unfriending trend that you, you hear about, uh, puts another spin on that. Maybe you just unfriended some innocent, well, everyone, that's a different matter entirely, but you know, you might have unfriended someone that, that you actually agree with on whatever the thing is. Right. Oh, I am that's... surprised by how many people will share stories without looking at the source, you know, looking at, you know, they just read the headline and share. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if people even just added that step into their process, you know, who published this originally? And is this a, is this a media organization I'm familiar with? I've heard of, um, they've, there are organizations that have gotten so clever about looking exactly like a news organization and they create names that sound like news organizations. So mm -hmm. if you haven't actually heard of it, um, just do a little bit of checking. There are lists out there of known um, basically fake news sites. So be familiar with those lists. Or if you're looking at a, an article and you're wondering, um, just do a little bit of checking on that source and, and find out who's sending it and what that motive might be. Is there, so is that something that on on the list that you're talking about, um, you can see like who is who created this, you know, bogus news organization and kind of what they tailor their messages to be? Yeah, there is, is a link we could provide maybe. 
Yeah, there's one. Um, a lot of times you can find them just by doing some some searching. I had mediabiasedfactcheck.com. That's one. Um, they actually have a slider too that shows you. You can put any organization, whether it's you know fake or real, in, um, and it sort of sort of shows you the political leaning to it. And obviously, if you're talking about one that leans all the way to the right or all the way to the left, you're probably not getting you know unbiased news. So, and there are lots lots of places out there that you can search. And a lot of times, just doing a little bit of Google search um, on that the name of that organization, you'll come up with that information pretty quickly. Um, Amy, will you talk a little bit about the Wichita Journalism Collaborative and um, how you all are, are working to prevent um, any kinds of uh, bias or misinformation um, within that organization? Sure. The Wichita Journalism Collaborative is fairly new, um, just launched in the last couple months, and it is... Um, sort of a hub, a cohort of several media partners and other community partners in Wichita um, with, with the intent of supporting quality local journalism. That's the main goal. Um, one of our goals is also to combat misinformation, disinformation, fake news. Um, and that's a, that's a goal that we're honestly just getting started on. But our, our first course of action well, there's two. One is to make sure that we're getting accurate information out as much as we can. Um, and then the second that we're getting ready to launch is some education on how to spot misinformation, how to do some of the backgrounding yourself, how to do things like um, a reverse image search using Google's reverse image search. Um, you can put a photo in or you can put the URL for a photo or you can actually upload the photo itself and find out um, how long has that photo been in circulation? When was it created? Who's all been sharing it? Has it been manipulated or changed? Hmm. Um, that's, that's one way. It's just one of many that you can just kind of double check that information. So we hope to sort of launch a campaign of that kind of information and education for people. Do you know when uh, some of those resources will be made available? Uh, September 1 is when we're hoping to, to launch that initiative. Oh, excellent. That's great. We'll look forward to that. Um, I have a, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. One thing that I did want to point out is that uh, the sky is not falling. Fake news has been around for centuries. Um, in America, Benjamin Franklin published a fictional newspaper called the Independent Chronicle in 1782. What's happening now is that um, with social media, every person can be at once a publisher, a reader, and a journalist, a journalist, and by sharing information online. And so a lot of people are not paying attention to the experts like Angela and the people that have the training and are actually committed to journalistic principles. And so I think that the biggest thing that I can share is that fake news is not a new phenomenon, but we are falling victim to not listening to experts, but like both Amy and Angela. Hmm. Um, before we move on, I have a couple of uh, audience questions from Facebook that uh, relate to what we've been talking about. Um, if you report someone's Facebook or Twitter post for something that is incorrect, will they know who reported it? They will not know. Um, <laughs> it is current. The last time I checked on this, it, it was currently in beta testing. So you might not have it on your Facebook because at any one time, Facebook is running seven different betas. So your Facebook could look different than my Facebook um, mm -hmm. as far as features. And so um, as I understand it, they will not know. Um, and your report will um, probably not get the post taken down or flagged. It will take a couple people to do it, just like reporting anything on someone's profile. That. Sounds like it's well thought through. That sounds good. Okay, uh, Chris from Facebook asks, "What are fact-checking sites that aren't politically biased? That aren't politically biased? Are there some that are? And you know, fact-checking sites that are actually fake news fact-checking sites? Well, and some will. Ouch. We can say Snopes, and somebody is probably going to say, "Oh, that's politically charged," you know. But Snopes.com and fact check, uh, fact check, or fact checking, fact -check .org. Um, is another one that I like. Yeah, those are the two that I was going to mention as well. Um, I think that everyone who floods my feed with stuff, I just re respond back to them with everything uh, that's, you know, here's from Snopes or here's from factcheck.com or here's where you can find that article. 
And uh, I know just on a local level, I think it's just like we talked about the bots and that viral video and that viral photo getting out there. And really once it spreads and it's, the thing about it is it's cyclical. So it's something that may come up now and then five years later, it's gonna come up again and then it gets reshared and then people don't realize that it's not actually even happening right now. It's dated back for five years ago. And so that's something that we battle too, not only misinformation, but um, stories that are coming up from years ago that people are sharing, believing that they're current and they're not. So that's one thing that we a lot of times have to dispel um, on our side as well. I was going to ask you, Angela, what uh, other what other issues that you face, KWCH, obviously a television station, but, um, you know, the digital content that's getting shared out in all different kinds of ways. Um, so you you experience people, I don't know if I can say missharing <laughs> of old data. Um, do you see other other kind of phenomenon uh, phenomenons in, in what you do that... Uh, relate to to the misinformation or disinformation i think that's really one of the biggest ones is that it'll it'll be um, a story that will come up that will be old or it'll be um, for us particularly something that has a name on it that's regionally or specific to a neighborhood or something like that that's tied to wichita or um, the area and someone might think that it's related to us and it'll be from you know, another state or another county or another city, and they don't know. They just see um, maybe Riverside. Mm -hmm. And so then obviously we are known for Riverside here in Wichita. And so that's going to be shared here. And they're like, why aren't you covering this? Why aren't you doing this story? Mm -hmm. Then we have to go through and I'll go through and I'll check and I'll look and I'll do my due diligence going through and I'll say, oh, this wasn't from uh, Wichita. This was from somewhere else. And then they're like, oh, well, thank you. And a lot of times, really, as a news organization, a lot of people do reach out to us because they just want us to say, dispel whatever they're seeing or confirm it. That's really what they're looking for is for that guidance. And so on the digital side, especially on Facebook and Twitter, just a simple Google search helps them and lets them know that um, whatever they're seeing is either real or not. That is a lot of engagement with your viewers that way. I mean, and, and it does, I, I would think over the course of time, you're educating a lot of people. It um, is. Yeah. It, that's, it, does. it, take, <laughs> it, can't, it takes a lot of time, but um, we're building those relationships. And obviously, you know, that's what we are here for, especially as a local news station. And we want to build that trust. And sometimes, especially when we're getting bombarded with the same content over and over, we know that it's something that we need to address to let them know, um, again, whatever is that, whatever it is that they're seeing, is it true? Is it local? Is it something that they need to be concerned about? Is it something that we need to um, then alert more of the public about? Or is it something that, you know, that they, they can share again with their friends and let them know this is not true? <laughs> So the volume of news is overwhelming. We've pretty much covered that. Um, and as newspapers fold and media outlets consolidate and change names and otherwise morph, um, it seems pretty impossible to know before reading something if it was written by a person who actually uh, has journalism training and access to an editing structure that's dedicated to providing factual information and not meant to persuade. Um, but it seems the alternative to reading anything with just without disc discretion um, might just be to pick one news source and not waver from it. But neither seems like a recipe for you know, democratic enlightenment. Um, what do you all suggest that people do? Because, you know, we talk about ways to check on the, the on the source that you're looking at. But who wants to spend so much time like looking everything up? What do you guys recommend for people? Uh, so one thing that I would definitely recommend is to not so much focus on the news sources that you're getting your information from, but more on the fact of who is more likely to fall victim to fake news and when you're more likely to fall victim to fake news. Mm -hmm. um, they have found that people that are older have less media literacy when it comes to the internet. And so maybe being more cautious when you're looking at news sources online or on your phone, 
versus in the local newspaper or on the local TV station. I think that that's one advice that I've found to be very helpful. Amy, any thoughts? Uh, well, of course, I think it's good to be um, consumers of news from several outlets. You know, I just think that that's the best practice. Um, and especially if you're if you're wavering on a topic or something that uh, one publication has written and you really want to get at, you know, the heart of it or you're not sure if that sounds quite accurate, um, go to several sources. And of course, I like local news, you know, I, I feel like I feel like we can trust the people who live in our community and work for our TV stations and our newspapers and um, KMUW. So I like local, um, but then I think it's it's smart to you know read some national media outlets on the same topic and see what they're saying and see if the see if the stories jive or if there's a, a big discrepancy in what the media outlets are saying. Yeah, I agree. Um, obviously, you have your trusted sources that you agree with. But I'm always out there and I encourage other people to go looking for other trusted sources that may have a differing opinion, but provide the same details uh, for you. Um, I, I, it's something that I pass along to my parents because I know that they are on social media and they like to share things. And so if I know that I'm telling my parents that I try to share that same uh, bit of information, especially with our viewers, to just let them know, um, you know, there are other sources out there and we're working with those um, same media outlets, especially on the national level to gain information. And we don't just get um, our information from one source. We don't just get it from CBS or CNN. We try to gather as much as information from different uh, newspapers and television stations as we can and um, to get the most reliable information to make sure that it's accurate and correct and you know fair. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. and on that note, Angela, um, I wanted to get your opinion on the idea of one thing that we talk about in academia is that when television was new, everyone watched the same nightly news and they had a shared um, understanding of what the world looked like. But nowadays, there are a million channels to choose from, a million news websites to choose from. Um, and one of the things I was curious from your perspective as a local journalist is how do you uh, deal with people that are getting news from a completely different source that is um, in uh, Yeah, that's something that we deal with a, a lot. Um, again, we get those messages. Why aren't you telling the real story? Why aren't you? Again, it's one of those things where um, I, I will I will take the link and I will go ahead and read it, just depending on who the source is, of course, of course that they've sent it from, um, and then go through and um, provide documentation that goes with it to, again, either dispel or confirm or say, oh, if there's something that we don't have, like, this is definitely will something we will look into. You know, we don't ever want to, um, well, sometimes, but for the most part, we don't want to uh, step on any butterflies or anything like that. But we do want to uh, take as many viewpoints as there are and make sure that we're um, putting it in the most concise form that's out there. Um, I know that there was a, a local story that had circulated just about some information that a lot of people started to share and said this was presented incorrectly and you guys need to tell the story and here's the truth. And once we went out and we talked to both sides and we gave the information, people were like, oh, thank you, you know, for telling the story. And really, they just said, thank you for digging into the story and letting us know where the information came from. And I think that's what people, they just want to know that the information that they are provided, if they're being told somebody is backing it up with some sort of credibility, obviously. I think that's part of what I was talking about in giving people a look behind the curtain. Anytime journalists can be transparent with how they're doing their jobs and and exactly where they're getting all of their information, I think that um, leads to better credibility. So that uh, kind of segues nicely into this next question, just of how much do agenda-driven materials affect the public perception of media, all those data sources out, out there that are acting like media, this pamphlet I got in the mail that looked very official, all kinds of you know statistics, 
packed in there. Um, I mean, is it exacerbated by or maybe a result of a loss of faith in experts and scientists? Um, what happens when, you know, when we, we, that public perception of media starts to crumble? Um, so from a data perspective, we have um, found through research that if people do not, so if Angela presents a new story that does not agree with someone's point of view, they will go elsewhere to find a source that agrees with their point of view. It's not that the public has lost trust in the media, it's that they are seeking sources that confirm their biases that they already have. Um, so one thing that I have found is that someone will say, well, this is what I believe, and they'll try to find a source that corroborates that belief rather than examining that belief at in addition to the local news. So I think that that's one big thing that people are chicken and egging is it's not that we've lost trust in the news. It's that we're trying to prove what we believe is true. Hmm. Yeah. And I agree with that because people are going to come for the local news because we are the only one who are tell is telling what is happening in their community. So they want to know, what happened down the street. They want to know when it happened. They want to know the weather. Um, those are the things that they come to us for. Uh, on the national segment, obviously, when there are differing opinions, they will go um, try to find something elsewhere. And sometimes they'll bring it back to us and let us know that this was a different opinion. And again, it's one of those things where we try to engage in a high conversation about, okay, here's where we got our information and here was what's presented. And so we try to keep it on that level to maintain their, uh, their respect and let us know that we are using credible sources to provide you this information. Um, but obviously we know that a lot of times they're wanting to know what's happening in their neighborhood, especially on a local level. Yeah. And Sarah Jane, to the beginning of that question, you talked about um, all of these kinds of things that sort of look like journalism. I mean, I, I really believe that's a huge problem. And I think so many people do not distinguish between uh, journalism and things that look like journalism, right? And, and even, no offense to my friends in PR, I have many, but a lot of what public relations professionals do looks the same as what journalism what journalists do, right? They, um, they take photos and share photos from things and they write stories and feature stories. Um, they look the same, they're the same kinds of activities, but in the end, the question is, what's the purpose behind that pamphlet or that story? And when you're scrolling through items on social media, you don't have the context. You don't know if something, if a story originally originated from somebody, someone who is working in PR or, or journalists necessarily, unless you take the steps to dig a little deeper and, and find the source. And on that note, Amy, one, um, one thing that I, consistently ask myself is was this written for entertainment or for information um because i i personally really like the onion and that's a great example of a parody in a satire site that i people i see people share all the time as if they believe it's true and so there there's almost this um phenomenon of people seeing entertaining pieces of um content online and treating it like news. And I think that's a really great point. Hmm. Then there's another layer on top of all this, the, the influence of other opinions over our own and the starkly different perspectives that people have on the world around us. Like two people could read the exact same factual sentence and without doubting its actual content, they could still have utterly different interpretations of what it all means. Um, but I mean, is that actually the best case scenario that we can hope for? Um, or is the best that we could hope for, uh, you know, I don't know, some world where we have a, a more understanding? I think at the end of the day, as a journalist, you have to lay out the facts and everybody comes with their own, um, they come from their own backgrounds, their own perspectives and their own biases. But uh, so their own values, their own values yeah. that they, to the, to, um, when they read something and you hope that when you write it, that you've written a complete story that covers the facts and that they will take away the important parts of those facts. Unfortunately, sometimes they take away a little bit more or a little bit less than um, that you would hope that they would. 
But uh, at the end of the day, our jobs are to lay out what we've learned, what we've um, investigated, what we've vetted, what we've d dug up and lay it out and let them take that away from that story. Mm -hmm. And again, that's part of the democracy is they get to take away the information that they want from the what we put out there. Yeah. One very frightening thing is what Susan was talking about, the erosion of facts, I think she called it. Um, and that what's scary about that is if a journalist looked outside and said the sky is blue today, there are people who would argue that point. You know, it's, I, I feel like when we were young, um, we learned in the first or second grade to distinguish fact from an opinion, right? And I, I feel like we are not there right now. I, just, I feel like there are people who just cannot agree on what's a fact and what's an opinion. Hmm. Yeah, good. and uh, the RAND Corporation called that a truth decay, which is the diff difficulty um, we have today in separating fact from fiction. Additionally, appeals to emotion are much better at spreading like a piece of content mm -hmm. online. And so people are um, reacting more heavily to emotional headlines. And so you're seeing that in the other pieces of content like the pamphlet you received. Hmm. So what are some of the best ways for people to know if what they're watching or reading is factual? We talked about some of the, you know, checking uh, the sources, um, but on top of that, you know, how much of a lean or an agenda or an interpretation might whatever it is bear? Um, are there any other kinds of tips that you all can provide before we wrap up tonight? I mean, I, I would obviously say if it's a, a, a fake um, I don't like the term fake news, but if it was a fake site that it's coming from, that there are probably some telltale signs. Um, the, the website itself probably isn't constructed as well as a news site. Um, there may be like spelling errors. There may not be just things that just aren't, don't make sense about the article um, that you would think that they don't make sense. Um, so I would say if you see common mistakes like that, that's probably some uh, place to stay stay away from. And if it's from somewhere where you've never heard of, but they just pop up with an article about, you know, that's leaning in a certain direction, then it probably has um, very little bearing on the truth. Oh yeah, Angela, I always go to the about section. So like you, when you're on the website, you click about, and then half the time they say, we are a parody website distributing <laughs> news. And it's like, oh, this is not a real site. And so I really would encourage you to click on both the author. Um, so the author um, should have a name, should have a photo, should have a contact. So that even if that's um, their Twitter name, an email address, their work email, and then I would click on the site itself. Um, who are they backed by? Are they um, a news organization? So like if you go to the Wichita Eagle, um, in their mission, their about section, they say who they are. Um, and I think that's one of the easiest ways to determine online. If you're watching a news uh, segment, um, ask why this information is being shared. Are, is the person that's saying the piece trying to get you to feel a certain way? Are they trying to get you to vote a certain way? And if the answer is yes, it's more than likely propaganda. Additionally, with the author, I think that's a really good tip. Um, you know, see who the author is. If they have a bio with the author, a lot of times on those really fake sites, I guess a fake is fake is fake, right? Mm -hmm. um, they'll make these grandiose claims about the writer, you know, and try to claim their expertise in whatever the area might be. And it doesn't usually take too long, again, with some Google searches to try to find out if that's actually true, if that person is indeed a medical expert or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. So lastly, tonight, how can news organizations do better? Um, let's say I work for a news organization and I want to help. What can I take back to the team? Or what would you all recommend that uh, staff actually keep in mind to do? I would say um, the, sim the simple principles of journalism, you know, accuracy, um, you know, making sure that the, it's important information, that it's timely. Um, all those things that you learned in journalism school, um, because that, at the end of the day, that's that's what it's all based off of, that we have accurate information that we're giving out, that it's vetted. You know, the two sources is a real thing. I know it's so easily, especially today with Facebook and Twitter, that we can put together a story without even talking to anybody. 
but there's so much more behind a lot that's written out there and posted um, that you can gain from just making a simple phone call or in our uh, business, you know, interviewing someone on camera. But uh, that's really on for our end, I think, is making sure that you have the accurate information, especially in the age of social media where everything lives on. And I'll let, I'll let Amy have the last word. Um, the biggest thing for me, coming from an academic side, is to avoid cir circular reporting, which is where um, you just simply repost an article that another news organization published. Um, and this creates a compounding effect that makes it really hard to combat, combat fake news. Because if the first news organization made a mistake or somebody was misquoted, then it keeps being being reported and reported and reported. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the uh, biggest stories from the election was that Mar uh, Donald Trump removed Martin Luther King's bust from the Oval Office, um, and a legitimate news source did publish that, and everyone else was like, oh, it's, well, it's vetted then, but it was a mistake from the journalist, and it's still circling as fake news online. And so I think that's the biggest thing for me is that as a journalist, um, make sure that you're vetting other journalists, especially in the age of the internet. Hmm. Um, I would say the transparency that I've already talked about would be a big one for me. Um, answer questions about how you do your job, be transparent with how you're doing your reporting. Um, sometimes that's in your story, sometimes that's elsewhere, just in talking with people in comments perhaps. Um, and then the other thing is to be professional on social media. And the big one I mean with that is headlines. You know, don't write clickbait headlines and, and distinguish yourself um, in that way from some of these fake news operations. Awesome. All right. Well, these have been wonderful uh, tips and, and ideas. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. It's been a very interesting discussion. Um, and to all of you, I hope you've enjoyed our program. Please come back next time, and until then, check out EngageICT.org for past videos, podcasts, and more. I'm Sarah Jane Crespo. Thanks for joining me for Digital Democracy on Tap, and good night. <laughs>